Our final uh, presentation before we open it up to discussion uh, will be from Tom Klitgard. Uh, uh, Tom is, brings um, decades of experience, one of the pioneering uh, uh, Western American attorneys uh, working in China. And um, the, the title of his presentation is The Value of Vagueness as the Door to Social Change in Emerging Protests in China, Lessons Learned from Its Neighbors. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. You're Good welcome. morning, everybody. What is the value of vagueness in social control and in China, in protest and change? Now, you're all teachers. You, you do your homework and prepare for class every day. You can tell the truth. This is, we'll cut off the thing. Do you? OK, well, I'm going to I hand it out an attachment to my talk today. You have it right in front of you. It has the picture of the gentleman on the front. And we're going to go through that as part of the presentation uh, later on. So just look at it for a minute, if you will. And what I want to give you, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to give you the takeaways, the bottom line of all this. Then I'm going to talk about the PowerPoint, fool around with that. We'll talk with some ideas on that. And then we'll just have kind of, again, a summary. So let's talk uh, uh, about the takeaways here. And I have them. What is the value of vagueness as a door to social change and emerging protests in China? And let me ask you, how many Chinas are there? Who haven't I talked to? Here's a gentleman over here. How many Chinas? One, two, three, four, five, six, or 10, or 12, or whatever. What do you say? No, I'm looking at you. Don't look around. This is a classroom. Come on. You can't look around the person behind you. How many Chinas? What do you mean? China. C-H-I-N-A. OK. I'll, I'll get you started. There's the People's Republic of China. One, correct? Okay. Is there another one? Come on, come on. Think correctly. Th think correctly, please. They're taping this. We're going to put it back to Beijing. There's the Republic of China, considered by China, Taiwan, yeah. considered by China to be a province. Now, OK, here for you. There are two more Chinas. Where are they? You got it. OK, and for you, come on, don't look down. How many? One more. What, four. Where's the other one? The other one was that you probably mentioned. Macau. Macau. Come on. The, anyway, there are, there are four Chinas, and they all have a different rule, different concept. They, they have the basic law in Hong Kong and Macau, right? That came around in the turnover. They have China's constitution from 1949, which has been modified and amended over the years. And they have the Taiwan constitution, which uh, has been around, depending upon whom you talk to, since 1928 or 1935. So there are different constitutions. So when we talk about China, we're really talking about four Chinas, because the rights are different in China. And for example, just a little uh, footnote. In Macau, when they did the basic law, they, did, they pretty much copied what they did in Hong Kong, as far as the, the basic law goes, the, their constitution. But they had a little adjective in there that may uh, uh, be interesting to our lady teachers here. They projected, in Hong Kong, they projected the rights of women in their constitution, in their basic law. In Macau, adopted two years later, what rights do they protect of women? Come on, come on, come on. The legitimate rights of women. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, do you think that was just put in there on a Friday afternoon because someone said we've got to put an adjective in there to, to uh, improve our government or improve our situation? No, for a reason. In China, every word means something. And that comes from the structure of the, of the language and the structure of the characters, where a stroke out of place can make you a dog or a cow or something else, so on. But now let's get to the bottom line here. I promise you I get to the bottom line, and then the rest of the talk can be boring as heck, and you can do what you want to do. <laughs> but here's, here's the bottom line. Uh, what is the value of vagueness? Oh, by the way, I should say, you're all teachers. What, is there a difference between vagueness and ambiguity? How about it? Someone in the back of the room, you can raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to come back and get you. <laughs> so, 
Okay, I don't see any raised hands. I'm on my path here. Here's someone at the very, very back. Is there a difference between vagueness and ambiguity? No, I know you're not a teacher, but you're a smart person or you wouldn't be here. Alice, come on, give us a break. I'm sorry? Right, ambiguity involves a choice, right? I had a job interview one time. Fortunately, I didn't get the job, but that's another thing. What, <laughs> what happened was they said, come for the interview at 10 to 12. At 10, I'm sorry, 10 to 11. So in my mind, that meant 10 minutes to 11. In their mind, it meant from 10 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock. I showed up at 10 to 11. The interview did not go very well, as you can imagine. <laughs> you see? So, <laughs> well, think about it. The interview is at 10 to 11. Okay. So anyway, uh, that's, that's my point. What is, what is, you got the difference. Vagueness is unclear. Ambiguity uh, has, has a choice in it. You can make a choice. So let me just cover here. Uh, what, uh, what, what are the benefits of, uh, what should you take away? And I've, I've got to read this here. Because uh, this is, if you forget everything else, this is what I, I got to say. The basic group of takeaways are vagueness allows the interested parties to work out issues without losing face. Write that down. That's important. Vagueness allows the government to adjust without losing power. Okay? Our main job when we're in government is to keep our power. We want the big car, we want the airplane, we want to see President uh, Obama, go take nice travels. It allows for, a, vagueness allows for a distillation of ideas. If it's vague, you have a lai wong, a going back and forth in, in Chinese, where you have these ideas distilled. When I go to court, I'm a lawyer, the worst thing I can do is not be prepared, not have my case argued out ahead of time with colleagues and friends, because they bring up things I never think about. There's a distillation, the same as you in the classroom. Uh, uh, the other day, <laughs> someone asked me a question. I, I, uh, I wrote an article on how the law and Confucianism affects the decisions of Chinese military uh, personnel. And so I was sitting at this dinner table with some people who were important. And one fellow said, well, give me one decision by the Chinese military that was affected by Confucianism. And I thought that I couldn't answer the doggone question. So of course, when I got back to my office the next day, I wrote him a little email. I said, every single decision is affected by it. Well, what he wanted me to say was, well, maybe this decision here to invade Korea or to invade someplace or else is affected. But that wasn't the case. It allows for a, dis a, di a di dilution, vagueness, of unrealistic demands. Every protest seeks a change. Why would you, what's the point of a protest? Or is the modern word in China correctly, I think, reform. Protest means you're, you're trying to tear something down in a way. Reform means you're adjusting to circumstances. So it allows for people to have unrealistic demands vetted. And it allows for uh, pragmatic results, which are based on experience. This is the Chinese way. In the United States, when we, our founders were geniuses, and when they drafted our Constitution, they thought the thing through, the federal system, the government, you know, and, and the courts and so on. In China, just speaking as a lawyer, what they did when they uh, had intellectual property issues, they didn't create some, go back and amend the Constitution and create a whole new set of courts. They established intellectual property courts separate and tried them out, see how they worked in Fujian province, so on. So the Chinese way is the pragmatic way. We tend to create a structure and then try to fit everything into the structure. The Chinese try to solve the problem, and then when the problem is understood or clarified, then they establish a system of dealing with it. Immigration courts, uh, intellectual property courts, uh, so on. Think of it that way. So it's, it allows it pragmatism. Pragmatism is the number one virtue in China. Uh, 
because that's how you survive. That's how you survive the British. That's how you survive everybody that's been there over the years in being pragmatic. Now, it allows uh, for the government and society, a, a government based on Confucianism and Buddhism rather than based on legalism. And let me explain what Confucianism and Buddhism are based on concepts of relationships and so on. They're flexible or malleable. Legalism is what you have, in, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but I'm going to probably offend everybody. Uh, so that's OK. Uh, this is a teacher's thing. And if you can't offend someone when you're a teacher, who can you offend? So let me, what, are the, what are the legalistic religions? Legalistic religions are Judaism, Islam, Christianity, all based on principles, on moral, articulated principles, and, in, and based on punishments. And in ancient China, a legalism was a way of running the government. You would have severe punishments for bad conduct. Humanism or Confucianism lets you go the other way. That lets you adjust to circumstances. So it allows for legalism and, and, Confuci and for uh, humanism. But what vagueness lets you do, lets the government switch back and forth between the two. It can be very legalistic. If you go 35 miles an hour, you go to jail forever. Or if you exceed in normal, if you do something else, you don't. But le legalism has a set of, when you have legal, in your classroom, when you have a set of rules, you can punish people, right? Well, I don't know if you can anymore. I went to a Jesuit high school in <laughs> 1948 and to the Dominican nuns and, in, then, and when you acted up with the nuns, I remember the nun had a rubber hose. And she <laughs> made you hold out your hand and you lined up all the boys and took the rubber hose and whacked you. Well, you say that's bad, that's cruel and inhuman. No, it wasn't. Actually, it was the best thing it had ever taught. Talk coordination, because <laughs> you had to pull your hands back, and then the nun would miss. <laughs> then they wouldn't come back to you again so for a while. <laughs> so it, it uh, essentially, uh, what the, the, the three basic things are takeaways, uh, uh, vagueness lets you change without losing face or power. If something is vague, you can change it. It lets you evaluate movement, and it lets you seek pragmatic results through experience. Or as to quote Chairman Mao, seek truth through facts. You got the facts first. And their cousin, it lets you avoid articulated extremism. Because when you have articulated extremism, then you have conflict. And as it, depending with the internet, and so forth, the conflict is sharpened. And then what happens? You got to go somewhere, you know. So it has those values. Uh, Machiavelli uh, told us years ago, knew something about people and in, in, in government, is vagueness lets you define the crime as well as the punishment as conditions change. And let me, now, now we're going to get to your paperwork here. Everybody got it? OK, look over here. Uh, let, 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 let's, let's look where it says second base. Do you see that? Page four. Now, look at Article 290. This is an extract from China's criminal code. By the way, the criminal code is the intersection of the rights of the people and the rights of the government. Each has rights. And by the way, in China, each has duties, which is unlike the United States. You have no duties as citizens here in the United States. In China, all the people have duties. And by the way, again, looking at social change in China, the Constitution protects citizens. It's, it's very clear when you look at the Chinese Constitution of social change and protest, who's protected? Citizens, not residents not persons. When you look at the constitutions of the other Asian countries, who's protected? Some, most of the time, persons. So anyway, look over here. Uh, look at our, on page four, Article 290. We're talking about protest. Well, Article 90 says, if you disturb people are gathered to disturb public order to such a serious extent, so forth, that it causes heavy losses. I underline those. Oh, what's a serious extent? 
What's a heavy loss? Who decides that? The government? If you're the teacher, do you decide if there's a heavy loss or heavy inattention or something? Or to somebody else? See, this is really uh, neat here. And then it, go, it goes on, if the circumstances, I'm not, now I'm down in 291. Come on, you've got to do your homework. You've got your paper in front of you. If the, if the circumstances are serious, well, then who gets punished? The ringleaders. Does it say that the protesters get punished? No, it doesn't say that. So this gives the Chinese government some movement, some room to let dissent come in to keep your power. Remember my example about the gears? You don't want those gears too tight. So here, an another one, Article 293, talks about uh, this is a crime. Look at 293.4, uh, chasing, intercepting, hurling insults in a flagrant manner. Who decides it was a flagrant manner? When I was in the service, and I was in the Army, but the Navy had a crime, we uh, knew about it, called silent contempt. Where, <laughs> no, well, you may be familiar with that as a teacher, where you would say to someone, do something, and they'd say, yes, sir. And you couldn't, in the Army, you couldn't punish it. That just went, in the Navy, that's what they call silent contempt. And you went to the brig, you said, say that once more, sailor, or you're going to be down having bread and water for a, a week. So anyway, so look, look at this, in a flagrant manner, or uh, creating disturbances in a public place, thus causing serious disorder. So if I'm the government, I, I can say, well, yeah, you created a disturbance in a public place, but it, but it didn't to cause a serious disorder, okay? So you look at this kind of things, and it gives you some idea of what I'm t uh, talking about. And over here, in Article 300, social change, Religion is a big issue in China. China has a moral, in its constitution, China has moral precepts. The moral, and as do most of the Asian countries, unlike the United States. But here in China, in Article 300, if you engage in a weird religion, weird religious sex, who is that? See? So then the one I like is, is about corruption. Look over here at Article 163. Talk about vagueness. Article 163 talks about employees, or any employee of any company or enterprise. Got that, everybody in front of them? Come on, we're studying. This, you get one unit for passing the bar, if you can look at the answer these questions here. Accepts any, any money, that's okay. And if the amount is considerably large, he gets a fixed term imprisonment of not more than five years. If it's considerably large, if it's huge, He'd be sentenced to fixed term imprisonment <laughs> of, of, and it's of less than five years and his properties can, uh, are confiscated. It goes down again where it talks about 395, where the expenditure of a state functionary, where people go to your fancy private schools and then spend $30,000 to send their kid from China, and exceeds its, where the expenditure of a state functionary exceeds his legitimate income, and the difference is huge. Well, who decides what's huge? Is that a vague term? Is it an ambiguous term? Can you, do you have a choice? Well, who decides? The court, OK, or the government. And who, in, in the end, who prosecutes these people? The, the public, in, in China, the prosecutor. And the prosecutor is appointed by the, by, the con, by the National People's Congress. They decide who they're going to prosecute. So they say, well, this is huge. $20 may be huge. Remember John Paul John in, in, in a piece of string? You remember that? Well, this is, was that huge or not huge? So this is what you look at. And then if you look over the same uh, in the courts, whoever in the enforcement of a judgment seriously neglects his duty. Well, what if they don't seriously neglect the duty? Who decides what's serious? Anyway, I'm making my point, I hope. Okay, now let's take a look. Where's our, where's our gadget here to, to, to uh, run this thing? Can you show me? Turn it over. Okay, we're go here's the PowerPoint. What is vagueness? Vagueness is something that's unclear. Vagueness gives you power. Make me happy, okay? Give me a good report. What's a good report? Is it arbitrary or principled? Can vagueness ever be arbitrary or can it be principled? Can you have a principled vagueness? 
Okay. I'm going to ask these, and where is the floor on vagueness? Is there a certain point you can't go beyond in being vague? You know, uh, think of the traffic cop. In California, we have the uh, speed limit that depends upon the circumstances. Is there a floor? Is 99 miles an hour still within the tolerance? So on. Next thing here is what, are the, what is the interaction of vagueness with the six values of Confucianism? Vagueness lets you deal with rituals, propriety, etiquette, and love within the family, and righteousness, and honesty and trustworthiness, and loyalty to the state, the main Chinese, a main Chinese virtue, and benevolence and humaneness to others. Those are Confucian uh, values. Now let's see if I can get the next thing. And there are five noble strengths of Buddhism, okay? Vagueness lets you deal with those. Faith, energy, mindfulness is the main one, uh, wisdom, which allows the greatest flexibility for change, vagueness or a lack of vagueness. And so my point is vagueness is the bridge between humanism and legalism. You can read all this. And, I'll, uh, and legalism believes that people if left to their own devices are bad. I don't know how many students you have that are fit that category, but <laughs> think about it. Uh, uh, and, and believe that people could, and humanism believes that people could be good if left to their own devices, so forth. Where does vagueness appear? It appears in the Chinese constitution, right in the duties of the government and the duties of the people. So vagueness in there, I mean, what, did I, what did I do with my 100% thing here? Two minutes. Huh? two minutes left. Okay, I'm going to, two minutes is great. Now, that's not vague. <laughs> I would say it's arbitrary, <laughs> but, but vague, vague, vague is okay. <laughs> Any, anyway, to, uh, the laws essentially in China are interpreted by, in the end, by the central government. And they decide constitutional issues and statutory issues. And so vagueness has uh, a real service. It lets, their, lets them work things out. Now, this is a very intellectual group. And I thought I would just, how, you tell me, kick me when I got a minute left, OK? <laughs> De Tocqueville, you know who De Tocqueville was. Come on, don't. First of all, everybody know who Shakespeare was? Everybody know who De Tocqueville was? De Tocqueville wrote a book in 18. 33 called Democracy in America. And uh, it's uh, what he said then, and I even have it done here. We have to recognize that China has been going through a revolution since 19, before 1911, for many, many years. To Tocqueville said this about the United States. He said, in a revolution, as in a novel, the most difficult part is to invent its end. And that's what China is doing now, inventing the end and continuing to invent the end of the revolution. And uh, he says here, uh, the greatness of America, and you can translate this to China, because those of us who went to China in the 1970s and earlier and so forth in this distinguished panel here know this. The greatness of America lies in not being more enlightened than any nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. And that's what I would leave to you today on the value of vagueness. It gives China a, a, an ability to repair whatever is bothering it and to uh, go along and to adjust to change. Well, thank you very much. There's a little test I have at the end, and you can look at it uh, later on. But uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>